Hi. Thank you for joining us today as we celebrate our diverse Jewish American heritage and the Sephardic and Mizrahi roots of Los Angeles. My name is Mary Kohav. I am the VP of Community Engagement Programs at the Federation, and I'm a proud Mizrahi Jew of Persian descent. Today's program came together as part of our Community Engagement Initiatives ongoing partnership with City Hall around Jewish American Heritage Month each May. We are in our fourth year, and although we normally convene in person at City Hall, this year's exhibit is a virtual one and can be online at the link we will share um, in the chat for everyone to view. I also want to thank Adina Bleich, Director of Jewish American Heritage Month at the Office of Los Angeles City Council Member David Rue for her dedication to this incredible annual celebration. Before we jump into the program, I wanted to share a little bit about the work of our Federation and specifically as it relates to our COVID-19 response plan. We have allocated $6.2 million toward new programs and amplified partnerships to meet the increased need for food, social services, and meaningful Jewish engagement. In the months ahead, we are expanding our social service work by making large investments in free food providers. We're increasing cash assistance funds, providing funds to to help their members in need and dramatically grow our Jewish loan fund. We're making major investments in supporting families that will now need more to help pay for their children's Jewish experiences. We've also created a new program to help organizations manage the costs of reopening in compliance with COVID-19 regulatory requirements. Finally, the need to repair our world has mobilized the community, and we are also expanding our social justice work including launching a new Jewish service corps for young adults and investing in diversity, equity, and inclusion work, such as facilitated workshops and discussion groups. And now before introducing council member David Rue, Donna Maher, who heads up our Y&S Nazarian initiative at the Federation, one of our partners on today's webinar, will share about this initiative's important work. Donna? Hi everybody, as Mary mentioned, my name is Donna Maher and I have the honor of leading the YNS Nazarian Initiative at the Jewish Federation, where we really are, we really put on programs to celebrate Iranian heritage and culture by giving voice to the Iranian Jewish community. Through our programs, we offer a one-on-one -on -one approach to help Persian young adults navigate community offerings, build programs that celebrate Persian Jewry, and work towards ensuring inclusivity online and in person. Our vision for the future of Los Angeles is one where Persian Jewish, or which where, is one where our Persian Jewish community is engaged both as participants, but also at, as leaders throughout the Jewish community at large. And this is really just the beginning of celebrating the diversity of, of, that we have within our community here in LA. Since our launch of the, of the Nazarian Initiative three years ago, we've already reached thousands of community members and we're really, really proud to be part of this beautiful event tonight. Thank you again to everyone for joining. Thanks, Donna. And now I'm honored to introduce Council Member David Rue, co-founder of the City of Los Angeles' Jewish American Heritage Month. Thank you and hello everyone. I am Council Member David Rue. And I want, to, I want to welcome everyone on the call tonight and thank you all for joining us. And I am very honored to be here with you and to join this exceptional panel of speakers. I was very thrilled to co-sponsor our Jewish American Heritage Month virtual exhibit this year. And I really want to thank again the Jewish Federation, David Sisa, Suisa of the Jewish Journal, uh, the Sephardic Cultural Center and all the other sponsors. And of course, a big thank you to Dylan Kendall, who curated the exhibit with research from Maya Ferdman and also input from Rabbi Buskila and Tabby Raphael. Now, you may be wondering, how could the first Korean American on the Los Angeles City Council, who isn't Jewish, um, became so involved with the Jewish American Heritage Month? Besides my very deep connections to the Jewish community and the similar values that our cultures all share, um, the story is very, very LA. Um, I became a council member about five years ago. 
And not long too after, I created the Asian Pacific Islander American Heritage Month to celebrate Korean and other Asian cultures in the month of May. At that very first celebration, I invited a very active Jewish community leader to participate. He was super excited to learn and celebrate Asian American heritage and culture, but more importantly, he shared with me that May that he said, did you also know that May is also Jewish American Heritage Month and that no one has ever done anything official in the city to celebrate? That was shocking to me, given that the philanthropic and civic contributions of the Jewish community that I immediately spoke with my colleagues, Bob Blumenfield and Paul Koretz, about creating Jewish American Heritage Month. And of course, the rest is cultural history. And this year, um, uh, we've done many before, but this year it gets larger and larger. And, and this year we recognize the Sephardic and Mizrahi Jewish roots of Los Angeles. And I have learned tremendously from this exhibit. And this is an amazing opportunity to recognize a community that has been contributing to LA since they first arrived around the 1850s. Whether it was helping to design the architecture of Venice Beach and the Shrine Auditorium, or building one of the first Persian American Jewish civic action organization, this community has made a vast contribution to our city and to our history. And you know, I was first introduced to both the Sephardic and Mizrahi cultures when I traveled to Israel and I loved it all. The colors, the architecture, the welcoming spirit, and of course, the food. The Jewish roots of Los Angeles runs deep and it continues to shape our city's vibrant culture and spirit of service. And as the councilman for District 4, I am always grateful for the opportunity to partner with leaders from the Jewish community and help put on Jewish American Heritage Month each year. And although we can't be together in person, we have found ways to be together while we are still safely apart. This online exhibit on the Sephardic and Mizrahi communities of LA turned out so well, and it is a wonderful tribute to this incredible community. So it has been a great way for us to reach even more people um, in this untraditional way and present information in a fun and engaging way. So I hope everyone had a chance to enjoy this online exhibit and is able to learn something new. And now before I turn it back over to Mary, I do wanna give another shout out to my assistant chief, um, Adina Bleich, who was so instrumental. And I, and I think if there's one person more excited about month of May, uh, about doing this Heritage Month than me, and that's Adina. And I really thank her for being my uh, uh, guide, uh, my leader and, and my guiding spirit in the Jewish American community. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mary Kohav and, all, and to all the wonderful panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Rue. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you in our programs. Um, one final note, as you'll see the background behind me, I just want to call attention to that, is a photo of the Hafsin table, which is what uh, Persian Jews display, or any Persian, um, right around Jewish New Year. And it contains a lot of interesting symbols, um, but I won't get into the details. We can look it up on the exhibit. Um, Many of you are familiar with our esteemed moderator, David Suisa, the publisher and editor-in-chief of the Jewish Journal. And we are delighted to, delighted to have him join us to moderate today's program. And without further ado, uh, David, take it away. David, you gotta unmute yourself, we can't hear you. I am now unmuted. I feel alive. I want to start with something extraordinary. The music that you played at the very beginning moved me to no end. When I speak to my non-Sephardic and non-Mizrahi friends, they're always shocked when I tell them that if you, Council Member David Wu, or Adina, or Mary, ever came to one of my family's bar mitzvahs or weddings, the music you will hear is Arabic music from Morocco. And that's why I was so moved by the music that you played. 
because our attachment to our home country is so deep and it never leaves us. One of the reasons I ended up moving to LA is because it brought me back to the memories of Morocco. The other thing that moved me with the music is we're going through one of the darkest moments in recent American history. We've been forced to separate physically. We cannot hug the ones we love. There is such deep loneliness. So many of us are bewildered. There's been so much pain and suffering that's gone through across the whole country. And yet you have this brilliant idea to inject a cultural moment during this dark time. And I wanna just congratulate you because I think it's one of the best things I've heard. All day long, I deal with the trauma of COVID-19, the protest movement and all the other things. And the fact that we're, we're gonna take a few moments today to get into a deep cultural moment, it just really a, a credit to the Jewish Federation Council member David Wu, I want you to know that we're neighbors because the Jewish Journal office is in Koreatown. And of course, we can't go to the office anymore, but we have a, a deep connection with the Korean community and Adina Bleich, the fact that you helped doing this, I think it's a great event. So before we get to the real superstars of the show, Danielle and uh, my good friend Tabby, I want to start with a caveat. The image of the Jew in America is very Ashkenazi. Um, when the average American thinks of the average Jew, it's Seinfeld, Spielberg. If you want to go further back, it's Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who marched with Martin Luther King, the great comics of the 50s and 60s. You name it, the image of the Jew in America is Ashkenazi. And the Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews were always under the surface. It's hard to explain why, but it's just kind of the reality. And what I've noticed in the past few years, this has started to change. That Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews have come up to the surface for the first time in Jewish American history, you have Sephardic and Mizrahi columnists every week in a, what used to be an Ashkenazi paper called the Jewish Journal. It's never happened before. When people ask me and they say, you know, Suiza, we really love the, the new journal. We love what you're doing with the Jewish Journal. You know, I, I kind of say tongue in cheek. Well, I think we've made it a little more Sephardic. And Sephardic, you know, there's always the dilemma of having to generalize when we deal with, with broad labels like Sephardic and Mizrahi. And we know always the dangers of generalization. I'll give you just one thought on that. <clears throat> as much as Buskila and Tabi and I are non-Ashkenazi, if you will, are Sephardic and Mizrahi, you should know that I spent most of my life in the Ashkenazi Jewish movement. The, I have studied Ashkenazi rabbis, and so has Danielle. I am fully engaged with the non-Sephardic world. At the same time that I'm deeply proud of my Sephardic heritage, I'm fully engaged. And I have to thank America and Los Angeles for that. My great-grandfather, my grandfather in Casablanca, spent his whole life never meeting an Ashkenazi Jew. And same thing with my ancestors. For centuries after centuries, they were born and they passed away without ever meeting a Jew different than they were. All of a sudden, I come to Los Angeles in our generation and I consider this a grand Jewish family reunion. Thanks to America and thanks to Los Angeles, there are Jews of 100 different nationalities in my neighborhood of Pico Robertson. For me, that's a great blessing. So as much as we're gonna discuss Sephardim and Mizrahi today, you always need to keep in mind that there's this wonderful cultural exchange going on in today's Jewish world. That includes Ashkenazi friends of mine who love our melodies, 
who love our food and who love our, our scholars and vice versa. This kind of, you know, whenever I hear cultural appropriation as a negative thing, in the Jewish world, cultural appropriation is a wonderful thing. And my Ashkenazi friends who have been stealing my mother's fish recipes, they're very happy and I'm very happy that they've stolen our recipes because they haven't and we're sharing. So with that, uh, with that introduction, uh, I'm hoping we're gonna engage in a fun conversation and you could not pick two better panelists because I'm very close to both of them. Uh, Danielle and I go way back. We've had hundreds of meetings. We have this obsession with coffee and books. And I can't tell you how often we, we've met. You could not have picked a better person. You know, uh, I think everybody knows him. He runs the Sephardic Educational Center, among other things. He's a regular contributor to the Jewish Journal. And then Tabby Raphael is a weekly contributor to the Jewish Journal, a rising star in Jewish journalism and a great speaker and an activist. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. It's great to be on with great friends. I love all the books behind you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> love all it. right. So Danielle, let's start with the history of the Jews, Sephardic Jews of Los Angeles. You know, I went through the exhibit and there's so much that I didn't know. Can you enlighten us in one hour or less <laughs> on the roots of the Sephardic Jews in LA and the challenges that they have faced? So, so welcome everyone. It's great. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here, especially with great friends and a wonderful audience. Thank you to the councilmen and uh, the Federation and the Nazarian Foundation and everyone who's uh, co-sponsoring and bringing this effort together. Uh, David, before I answer your question, you know, give me a preamble for a moment, if I can. Quick interlude. You inspired me. Uh, I was also very inspired by the music in the beginning. And you inspired me to do something which I think is important to tell. I mean, I can give you a lot of history and I will. But if I can indulge you just for 30 seconds, um, you know, very soon in a few weeks, we're celebrating the darkest day on the Jewish calendar, not celebrating, observing the darkest day on the Jewish calendar, Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of the month of Av. It's the anniversary of the destruction of the first and second temple, of the expulsion of the Jews from Spain, of many tragedies that befell the Jewish people over the years. I want to chant to you so that everyone understands what David was talking about, that our melodies, are so beautiful and uplifting. Picture walking into a Moroccan synagogue or a group of Moroccan Jews sitting on the floor at the Kotel in Jerusalem, the night of Tisha B'Av, ashes on their heads, sitting and mourning and crying. You would expect dirges because the language of the uh, poems that they're reading are very, very sad. They talk about the uh, expulsion from when we, were, when we left Egypt, and then when we left, now we're leaving Jerusalem. In great joy, we left Egypt. Now in great pain, we leave Jerusalem. It's a very, very sad and poignant moment. Here's what it sounds like. Let me sing, just two lines. This is Tisha B'Av. I've heard people say, why are you so happy? I've heard people come into Sephardic synagogues when we're doing Slichot, and they hear us saying, we sinned before you, have mercy on us, and we go, why are you so happy? And because we have a very beautiful philosophy, Sephardi and Mizrahi Jewry, that comes from the Bible. Serve God with joy. Come before God with happiness. We're not in perpetual mourning. There's a lot of things to be unhappy about, and especially, David, what you said in the beginning, 
when we're living in what are really a, a dark period, a challenging period, uplifting prayers, poems, even on Tisha B'Av, that we could chant and open our hearts. This is, I think, one of the beauties of our tradition that's not only open to us as Sephardic or Mizrahi Jews, but to all Jews who want to come and to experience that spiritually uplifting type of Judaism, which is so special and so meaningful, it touches my heart. Well, you know, Daniel, you yeah. just did something very Sephardic. First of all, you didn't answer the question. <laughs> you didn't follow the rules <laughs> and you sang a song. I love that. So in that Sephardic spirit, I want to add something to what you said, which is we sing, right? If you go in any Jewish wedding, you read the Ketubah. And if you ever get a translation of the Ketubah, it's like a Verizon contract. It's fine print. It's like a, a prenup. It's legalese. It's parking all ticket. the dry stuff. The parking it's, ticket. Yeah, it's the dry, dry, the driest language you can imagine in the Ketubah. And traditionally, Ashkenazi Jews, they read the Ketubah. So there was an Ashkenazi rabbi at my nephew's wedding, and we had a Sephardic chazan, and he sang the Ketubah. In the Moroccan tradition, we always sing the Ketubah. So, exactly. so he, asked, he asked why, and it was the most amazing explanation I've heard. He said, you know, when, when you get married, so much of life is the mundane. You wake up in the morning and then who makes breakfast? Who takes out the kids and who takes out the garbage and, and who's going to do the shopping for this and blah, blah, blah. So much of a marriage is mundane things. And the Kitubah is very mundane. By singing it, we're making the statement that even the mundane must be done with joy. So I just thought I would add that, uh, Danielle. Well, to, to since you think, I'm going to sing something later. To us, absolutely. To, to address your question, I think we don't really have the time to go through a long history. So I want to touch on some key points about Sephardic Jewry in Los Angeles and their early arrival and their struggles, and perhaps to frame it in language which is quite relevant today, both in general and specifically to the Jewish community. Uh, so Sephardic Jews uh, started to come here in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, Jews that came from Turkey, uh, later on from Rhodes, uh, and later um, after the Holocaust, Jews that came from Greece, Holocaust survivors, from Morocco. Uh, Tabi could talk a lot more about the, the Iranian Revolution and when Mizrahi Jews came to Los Angeles, and I certainly remember that. But I think one of the threads, rather than giving a longer history, which everybody could read, you know, the exhibit does a good job of telling it. Um, I think a key point to um, keep in mind here is that Sephardic Jews, all Sephardic migrations that came to the United States had to be immigrants twice. They had to feel, the, they had the experience of being immigrants two times. Once immigrants to a brand new country, the United States, and to adopt to a brand new culture. And they also had to be immigrants into the Jewish community, the predominantly Ashkenazi Jewish community and they felt like immigrants for a long time. Many of them still continue to feel like immigrants, although things have drastically changed today, like you mentioned, David, in the beginning. But I think that was the challenge. They had to go through all of the trials and tribulations of being immigrants to a new country, a new language, a new culture, a new philosophy, a new sociology, a new way of life, challenges of, uh, I'll quote, like you said, an Ashkenazi um, a thinker, Abraham Joshua Heschel, wrote a wonderful book called The Insecurity of Freedom. The moment we came and we gained freedom, there was a certain insecurity of now we're going to assimilate, we're going to lose what we had. On one hand, we came from countries where perhaps we were persecuted, but sometimes that kept us together in our own little Melach in Marrakesh or in the little Jewish neighborhood. Now we come to the big America and we have a lot of freedom that comes with a potential price to pay. Sephardic Jews had to deal with that. Mizrahi Jews had to deal with that when they came to this country. And they also had to deal with migrating into the predominantly Ashkenazi Jewish community. This was strange for them. Why? Because they themselves knew, Sephardic Jews knew, that for the bulk of Jewish history, for the bulk of Jewish history, Judaism has been largely a Middle Eastern, Mediterranean, and North African religion. For the majority of 
our history as a people, we spoke Middle Eastern languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic, later on in the Ottoman Empire, Ladino. Not until about the 17th or 18th century did things start to change. We also know, as I've spoken uh, even last night in one of the classes that I gave and throughout my classes, that the major contributions to, for example, medieval Jewish thought that shaped the identity of Jews, both Sephardic and Ashkenazi, came from Spain. Whether we're talking about Aristotelian rationalism with Jewish law blended by somebody named Maimonides, or whether we're talking about mysticism blended with uh, Midrash and Talmud called the Zohar, written also in Spain by Moshe de Leon. When we talk about the golden age of Spain or the golden age of Tzfat in the 16th century, the Kabbalists, these were all names like Cordovero and Abu Lafia and Caro and Mojo and Abu Hav that all came from Turkey. They all came from Constantinople after the expulsion from Spain. They came from Spain originally. These were the minds that shaped Judaism and Jewish ideas for over 1500 years. So for suddenly Jews who came from these countries to come into a culture that's suddenly all about bagels, cream cheese and lox and fiddler on the roof and klezmer music, and they're out of this and they're not part of this, not part of the leadership, part of the culture. This was an additional struggle that was on top of trying to become an American. I think this is very, very much what happened here in Los Angeles to many of the Sephardic Jews. All right, thank you, Danielle. Uh, Tabby, so Hi. since the Sephardics have been talking for 12 minutes, <laughs> you better talk for a long, long time right now, all right? I'm asking you, when I heard that thing about double immigrant, I'd never heard that before. And you and I have talked about this forever. It's a great insight, the fact that you know, we're double immigrants. We're immigrants to America and we're also immigrants to the Jewish world. So you have your own journey to Iran and you've written about it so often in the Jewish Journal. Share some of your insights on that. So first of all, I want to say, I love listening to you and Rabbi Buskila. It reminds me of when I get together with a bunch of my Persian friends before COVID. <laughs> that moment when you guys started humming the same tune was just amazing for me. I think a lot of uh, the participants appreciated it. Thank you to Council Member Ru. Thank you to the Jewish Federation, to the Nazarian Initiative. Of course, um, I'm humbled to speak alongside you and Rabbi Buskila, two mentors and friends. Um, I was born in Iran after the revolution. And uh, I grew up there in the 1980s, and if you had told me over 30 years ago that one day I would be the chosen representative of the Mizrahi community for something sponsored by the city of Los Angeles and a Jewish federation that cared about Jews, I would have asked you one question. What's an American Jew? Because just like both of you are reiterated, and this is actually you're my editor and you don't even know this, but next week's column is called Mizrahi Mizrahu. <laughs> I love that. And I actually say that, not to give it all away, but, uh, you know, many Ashkenazi American Jews have never met, let's say, a Persian Jew, especially since they're not in the big cities. I meet them every year when I'm at APAC policy conference, and you can't imagine the look in their eyes when, they, uh, when I tell them I'm from Tehran. I mean, imagine standing at APAC policy conference and speaking to somebody from Tehran. You'd have to alert the authorities. Um, <laughs> it's so funny because I also, growing up in Iran, never met a non kind of brown skinned, dark haired Jew with a very Arabic or Persian sounding name. So when I came to the US, when we came as refugees in 1989, believe it or not, Ashkenazim were exotic to me. I couldn't believe it. Who were these golden haired, some of them blue eyed, green eyed, you know, people? I actually, um, I probably shouldn't say this, but give me, you know, for, forgive me because I was seven. On the first day of school, I remember uh, I saw Ashkenazim for the first time kids in our public school. 
and that night I went home and I said, I asked my parents, I said, listen, um, does poor diet affect skin color? <laughs> and one of them said, what do you mean? I said, I saw, I saw kids today with, with sort of whitish skin and whitish hair. You know, are they not getting enough kebab? <laughs> oh, I heard a laugh somebody back there. But this, I mean, how is that for flipping it around on the other side? You know, I, if, I, if I run into an Ashkenazi Jew from Tulsa, okay, they've never met a Persian Jew. But when I came here, non-Persian Jews were exotic to me. And I threw myself to, into their history. I made friendships with them. I want to know, I, I still, I, I think I was the only nine-year-old who asked my Ashkenazi friends what countries their great-grandparents came from. I was obsessed. You know why? Because even as young, nine years old, I could connect it back to a thread of a Jewish story around the world. And that was both exciting and empowering to me. My God, there are Jews in Australia and in America and in the UK and in, you know, Iraq. So uh, I can spend one minute telling you a little bit about how my community, the Iranian American Jewish community arrived here uh, it's really amazing, actually. You know, when you speak about the traje tra 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 trajectory of, uh, of Jewish life, Jewish persecution, a lot of us seem to kind of end in the 1940s and think, well, that was sort of the last of it. You know, maybe there were persecutions and pogroms here and there, but there it was. It ended with World War II. And then suddenly you get the Persian Jewish community who escaped a fundamentalist Muslim country, not in the 40s, not in the 50s, not in the 60s. In 1979, going into 1980, 1990. This is what has always um, been amazing to people who I've spoken with about, about my community, is that you can't imagine that in 1989, a Jewish family like mine escaped the country due to war and anti-Semitism, right? What do you think of when you think of 1989? You think of I don't know, MC Hammer? You think of the Berlin Wall coming down? You don't think about Jews running away from a country with the clothes on their backs and being refugees. The and Lakers is that year tried for a three-peat and they didn't get it. That's what I think of. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so for my community of uh, uh, formerly 100,000 Jews in Iran, which dated back almost 3,000 years, were amongst the country's oldest uh, minority c communities. Imagine 2,700 years of a community that stopped in 1979. Why? Because the Islamic Revolution occurred. And in May 1979, this is a, I, I seldom throw out names, this is a name I use. In May 1979, the lay leader of the Persian Jewish community in Iran, a man named Habib al Qanian, who was a huge uh, entrepreneur and philanthropist, the unspeakable happened to him. The impossible happened to him. A few months, three months after the revolution, the regime arrested him for trumped up charges against, quote unquote, the enemies of God, which meant that he had sent money to charities in Israel. He had a 20 minute sham trial and then they executed him. I really want you to imagine this is the equivalent of, you know, let's say back when Malcolm Holm, Holmline was, you know, heading the conference of, a, you know, Jewish presidents, um, that this was as if somebody would have rounded up, God forbid, Malcolm Holmline and executed him. Right? So when they killed Habib Al-Ghanian, May 1979, that's when the Jews of Iran actually understood the regime wasn't playing games. And God help you if they ever accused you of being a Zionist. They would generally leave you alone every now and then if you were a Jew, but that was the dangerous part. A fine line between Jew and then being accused of being a Zionist after the revolution was so dangerous. And so many of us had already had family in Israel because they escaped in the 19, late 1940s and 1950s because they were such a Zionist and so excited to go live there, even if they lived in poverty. So the community dates back to, you know, 1979 and the 80s and my family almost 1990. And uh, we're about 50 to 60,000 strong here in Southern California. 
Um, and the chances are you've met Persian Jews. I'm not always going to say you had a great encounter. You may have actually met them when you knocked on their door to break up their late night social parties. Let's not kid ourselves. Um, but we're here and we're part of the fabric and uh, that fabric is starting to look a lot like a Persian rug. <laughs> before we get into, thank you, Tabby. Uh, before we get into the exhibit itself, because I think it's a fabulous exhibit and I want to discuss it. Uh, while you were speaking, Tabby, there's thoughts that came into my mind that I'd like to share with all the Ashkenazi, all the Ashkenazim in the audience. When I, when we moved to Montreal, Canada from Morocco, I was eight years old. I had never heard of the Holocaust. I discovered the Holocaust when I met Ashkenazi Jews. And over the years, I realized how the Holocaust has so traumatized so many of my Ashkenazi friends that it's something that's deeply embedded into their psyche. Even those who, don't, who are not survivors uh, and who didn't have family members who perished. And I think it's really essential that I make this point that when I grew up in Morocco, we did not have a trauma. So when we were raised with very much a feeling of optimism, a feeling of joy, whether you want to call that Sephardic or what, whatever it is, it's what we had. So when we moved to the North Pole called Montreal, and it was 20 below zero, we, we still had the joy, the joy of the Shabbat table and everything. And as the decades wore on, I've really come to appreciate how deeply embedded the, the, the trauma of the Holocaust is in Ashkenazi Jewry. And that is an essential difference between the Jews who lived that. It doesn't mean that there was no persecution in, in Arab countries, especially in Persian in, in Iran, like you were mentioning, Tabby. But I want to touch on a dichotomy because here we are in Los Angeles and we have a lot of differences. So just imagine the way we pray in a Sephardic synagogue is completely different than the way you pray in an Ashkenazi synagogue, as different as it gets. The way we pray is closer to a mosque than it is to an Ashkenazi synagogue. Uh, our, our melodies, our cuisine, our traditions, our customs are so different. So on the one hand, you can say, my God, we're really different. But on the other hand, imagine that we didn't see each other for 2000 years and we're still reading from the same book. So the differences reminds me of how much we have in common because the book is what keeps us in common. And it's so important not to forget both of those. We have those differences, but the differences are very, on the surface, deep down, we have a lot more in common. And what's in common is that we're still reading from the same book. So speaking of book, I love the exhibit and I really encourage everybody who's watching this show to get on the exhibit. And it really gets into pleasant, important detail. If you're interested in history as I am, as much as I'm interested in the history of Ashkenazim Jews, I'm encouraging all of you, Ashkenazi or Sephardics, I actually learned a lot. So, Danielle, can you speak about the exhibit from a Sephardic standpoint? And then, Tabby, I'll ask you. Yeah, and, and I'll actually tie it in, David, to your comments just now with a, a slight adjustment, because most definitely um, Mizrahi Jews or, you know, Mugrabi Jews, Jews from North Africa, um, you're right, the Holocaust was not really part of our major narrative. Um, but it's important to remember, and I will connect this to the exhibit and to one image in the exhibit. I know we were asked to uh, talk about an, uh, a particular image in the exhibit that we really um, connected to. And um, I was for 17 years uh, the rabbi of a Sephardic synagogue here in Los Angeles. Um, Sephardic Temple Tiferet Israel, which was founded by uh, Ladino speaking Jews. Um, and we had uh, significant populations actually of Holocaust survivors from Greece and from the island of Rhodes, uh, who eventually the, the, the synagogue of the Jews of Rhodes was once an independent synagogue. And then uh, when I came as the rabbi in 1993, they merged together. That's a little bit part of the Sephardic history of Los Angeles, that there were these 
communities that were both from um, Ladino speaking countries from the Ottoman Empire, from Greece, uh, islands and so on. And then uh, they it came to Los Angeles and had independent communities. One of them was called Sephardic Temple Tiferet Israel. One of them was known as the Sephardic Hebrew Center eventually. And then in 1993, when I became the rabbi, they merged together and became one community. And we had Holocaust survivors. We were actually the only Sephardic synagogue that on an annual basis had a Yom HaShoah ceremony that looked, and I'm going to say looked, just like a Yom HaShoah ceremony that you could find at Beth Jacob congregation. But it felt different. And here, I think it's really important to attribute um, something which is true. Um, let's forget the Holocaust and let's forget Jews for a moment. There are certain countries that if you visit, there's kind of like an overriding kind of a dark feeling to them. And there are certain countries that, you know, on advertisement for uh, tourist agencies will say, come and enjoy the sunshine, the Mediterranean, the beaches, the wonderful life of particular islands and places that you're going to enjoy vacationing. Even when I went to the Holocaust Memorial ceremonies of the Jews of Greece and Rhodes, there was a very different aura because those people came from very different countries. These were people who also had people who perished in Auschwitz and in the camps. And there was a very, very sad and somber moment when we were lighting the candles. But afterwards, when we would go into the social hall and have our, you know, borecas and boyos and uh, cuajado and cheeses and olives and all of the uh, little delicacies that we would have, the Sephardic delicacies, there was a, the, the joie de vivre that you're describing, even from Holocaust survivors who had the numbers on them, was magnificent. And I think that comes part and parcel from the, the tunes, the synagogue, the type of Judaism that they always knew of. It was never a wailing and crying Judaism. Like I said, including not on Tisha B'Av. So even the Holocaust survivors from that. Now to connect that to the um, exhibit. Um, so my favorite slide on the exhibit is a slide uh, of a rabbi, not because I'm a rabbi and he's a rabbi, but I wanna show you because I, I, should, only, I should only be able to be uh, one percent as great as this rabbi is, Rabbi Uziel. Rabbi Ben Sion Meir Chai Uziel, the rabbi that you see here, is the only rabbi in the history of this land of Israel to have served as a chief rabbi, Ashkenazi or Sephardic, is the only one to have served under three administrations in the land of Israel. He was the chief rabbi of the land of Israel under the Ottoman Empire, then under the British mandate, and then under the state of Israel, but only for five years. He died in 1953. He is my role model, he is my standard bearer for what it means to be a rabbi, what it means to be a leader, an intellectual, a traditional, modern individual. Now, you want to know something interesting, David and everyone? For two years, from 1919 to 1921, he left the land of Israel and was actually for two years the rabbi of the community of Salonika, Greece, the same community that in the Holocaust lost 95% of their population in the Shoah. And he wanted to encourage them, move, move to Israel. He kind of saw the writing on the wall, the anti-Semitism. Those two years deeply affected him because when he was back in the land of Israel, pre-state of Israel, during the Holocaust, during the 1940s, if you study history, he, as the chief Sephardic rabbi, dressed in all that Oriental Ottoman garb, was more active on behalf of the Holocaust than any Ashkenazi rabbi in the Yishuv in the land of Israel. He was the one gathering prayer services, uh, trying to pray to God to save those who were being burnt in the camps. He is the one that was responsible for putting the initiative in place to establish Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Memorial Day. Uh, it eventually became a different date than he suggested, but it was very important for him that this should never, ever be forgotten. At the same time, take a look at the smile on his face. Look at the sparkle in his eyes. He is one of the, uh, when I read his Torah, when I study his books, there's a different, it's, it's the same Hebrew of other Sephardic rabbis of later generations, 
It's the same Hebrew of Ashkenazi rabbis, same Hebrew. But if I were to arrange it to music, it would be a completely different genre of music. It sings at you. He doesn't preach. He doesn't talk down at you. He's not condescending. He's not insulting. He never speaks in the language of trying to frighten you into being a Jew, into observing more halakha. He does it all out of love. He was a man who believed in unity. He preached it from the opening sermon that he gave when in 1911, when he became the chief rabbi in Jaffa, Tel Aviv, all the way to his spiritual will. Two weeks before he died in 1953, he always talked about achdu ta'am, the unity of the people. When I see his picture, I'm inspired every day to continue to be Jewish. And I'm inspired like him in my work at the Sephardic Educational Center to take Sephardic Judaism and to spread its wings to all Jews. Because I think the teachings of this man, if the Jewish community, Sephardi and Ashkenazi, especially the chief rabbinate of today in Israel, if they adopted his teachings, let's talk for, for a moment about conversion to Judaism, still one of the thorns in our side, one of the most controversial issues in the Jewish world. If only 50% of what Rabbi Uziel spoke and wrote and ruled regarding conversion were implemented, 99.9% .9 of the problems in Israel regarding conversion and who is a Jew would go away. It's not time for me to uh, elaborate on it. I'd be happy at another point to talk more in detail. But he was a visionary thinker. But you know what's amazing? He was so ultra-modern, so super-modern. He was one of the first rabbis to permit abortion for psychological reasons. He permitted under certain circumstances. You know, we had this whole controversy. I was one of 14 rabbis to sign uh, a ruling, a halachic ruling. David, you know all about it. We spoke at length. It became the controversy yeah. during Corona about whether you could have... I remember. I remember. You remember. In fact, Daniel, I don't know if you remember, but you gave me his book 25 years ago when right. we first met. Yes. And, and, you now, and you know what? And you should write about the book for the Jewish Journal. Well, this is the right. book, right? Exactly. I gave you. So I just wanted you to know that this Truth. book was written by my very, very dear colleague. Mark Angel. York, Rabbi Mark Angel in New York. So, so it's a very good choice of the exhibit, Danielle. I commend you because that's, that would have been my choice of what to highlight for the exhibit. Because we don't have a lot of time, I want to give Tabby a chance to speak about the exhibit from yeah. your Mizrahi connection. Go for it, Tabby. So uh, I have two pages that really stood out for me. And the first one is going to surprise you. It's cursory. There, it's, you know, people put a lot of hard work into it, but there's nothing super fancy. If you look at the other vibrant, glorious, beautiful pages in the exhibit, this one doesn't stand a chance, right? Why didn't I pick food? Why didn't I pick music? Why did I pick this? This map, what is this? I'll tell you why. I actually became a little emotional when I saw this map a few weeks ago. Um, not to show the, the presence and, uh, you know, of, um, of the community all over, but I'll tell you why. Because at almost each one of these institutions, I don't see a designation on a map. I see people, I see persons, people whom I know, places where I've been. So if you look at, you know, down in the, uh, towards the center, near the bottom, you see Nesach Synagogue, right, next to Maimonides and the Sephardic Educational Center. That's not just Nesach Synagogue. That's Nesach Synagogue, which was founded by the late Rabbi Yedid Yeshofa, who was the former chief rabbi of Iran, who when the Ayatollah Khomeini came after the revolution, uh, he forced Rabbi Shofet and other religious minorities, their leaders, to bow down to him, which is something Rabbi Shofet said the Shah never even did. You know, uh, you look up a little bit more and you go to, for example, you know, uh, up in the smaller map in the top right, you see Kaaba by Faraj, which would give you a little bit of chuckle, you know, but I know Faraj. 
and my family has been ordering kebab for him for 25 years. And this, I have to tell you, if you want to get a sense of sort of little old Persian men and women and their grandchildren who are all named J Tiffany and Jaden, uh, and in some cases, um, you know, they're together, they're apart, they come and they sit down and they have their kebab together really the, the way that they used to. Um, the way that I used to see back in Tehran. So I put this map up so that really participants don't pass over it and don't look and say, oh, look, all right, well, that's where we can get dinner tonight. This isn't a map. This is a thread of somebody's life, right? Each person that you know over there, right down to the great grandchild of the owner has their own story to tell or has shamefully not even explored their story, which is another issue I have. But that's really one of the reasons I picked it. Um, Mary, is there time to do the rose petals or no? Do the rose petals. So I also picked the rose petals and I'll tell you why. They're edible. One of the uh, greatest Persian drinks ever invented is something called golab, which is um, rose water, which is water, uh, a syrup called rose water and sugar. And I want to tell you, I have non-Persian friends who have gagged when I serve them this. To me, this is the nectar of the gods. This is ambrosia. And I have to tell you something. There is nothing more Persian than coming to America, entering your first McDonald's for the first time, and having somebody put a Coke in front of you, only to spit it out and ask, where's the rose water? <laughs> Which is literally one of the first experiences that I had. And it's very interesting because in Persian Shiva ceremonies, when Persian Jews lose loved ones and you come to their home and you come to the synagogue, when we say the Besamim prayer and we pass something around, we say it over a bottle of rose water. And you ha Rabbi David Wolfe of Sinai Temple has such a funny story of him coming to mourners during a Shiva to the Persian Jewish community when it was first getting started. And, you know, and, and, and there was, I think it was in like the, the um, late uh, 90s. And there he is at the Shiva and they pass him rose water. Well, he doesn't know to smell it. He doesn't know it's for the best. I mean, so he drinks it. Right. So, so this is when I saw the rose petals. And, you know, I just, I had to connect, connect it back to the Coke at the McDonald's. You know, Tavi, there's so, so many thoughts that came to my mind. When I hear you, uh, both Danielle and both of you, and I, I realize that, you know, there's, there's the people and there's the Judaism. So we are the people, but the stuff that Danielle was talking about was a kind of Judaism. And the rabbi that you were mentioning who wrote the book on peace and love, was that you? What was the title of the book? So, so this book, David, Rabbi Angel, truth. truth and Peace, Loving Truth and Peace. This was the motto of Rabbi Uziel. Correct. So I want to pick up on that, Danielle, which is the author of the book, Mark Angel, did a video. He came to the Jewish Journal once and I said, you know, Rabbi Angel, go ahead and speak to all the community. And a lot of Jews and L.A. Ashkenazi Jews don't know much about Sephardic. And instead of talking about Sephardic Jews or Mizrahi Jews versus Ashkenazi Jews, instead of getting personal, he started speaking about Judaism. And he had this extraordinary distinction. Oh, my God. Rabbi Angel married Adina. We just got this little, I didn't know that. Thank you for that text. He spoke about the Judaism of the sun and the Judaism of winter, the Judaism of summer, the Judaism of winter. And it's like, we need both. And the Judaism that I was referring to earlier, I was raised in the Judaism of the sun. This is what we were. We were the Judaism of the, the desert and the ocean. It was the coziness of a neighborhood where we were hugging the Jewish rituals, where all those beautiful colors that you had, Mary, that you showed in the very beginning. I don't know if you noticed, but you had a little slip of the tongue that was very telling when you said 
all these amazing things behind you were Persian Jews, but then you also added also non-Jews. You're exactly right. So the Persian Jews were having customs and traditions that were picked up from Persian non-Jews, just like we have our greatest melodies. My favorite, me and Daniel, Ki Esmer HaShabbat, is an Arabic melody. So, so from that, we created a kind of Judaism, what I call Judaism of the sun. There was the sister of the king was in LA recently. They did this grand, <laughs> amazing gala of all the, 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 the Moroccan king sent a whole delegation and we honored the king of Morocco. And they asked me to say a few words and I thank them for helping Morocco. I give Morocco credit for giving me the Judaism of the sun. And the Judaism that I'm trying to spread in the Jewish journal is that Judaism of the sun. The Judaism of winter is an inherent part of our story. It's included, but it shall not overshadow the Judaism of the sun. And this is where the grand family reunion that we're living through here is we can, we're, we can both help each other and share. And I want to really, I really want you to write about that book, Danielle, in the Jewish David, Journal. David, if I, if I can, I'm going to tell you just, just one minute. It's really important because it's in the spirit of everything we're talking about. It's not really just a commercial. Um, I spoke to Rabbi Angel a couple of years ago when he was here in Los Angeles, when he did that interview with you at the Jewish Journal. Um, he was here for Shabbat and he spent Shabbat afternoon in my home, right here in my living room. And uh, I spoke to him about this book that he wrote. It's the only English language biography of Rabbi Uziel. Beautiful book, unfortunately out of print. So I proposed Rabbi Angel, I said, why don't we raise some money to reprint this book, but I want to add to it. What's missing in the Jewish world are translations in English of Rabbi Uziel's writings. Everybody knows the book by Rabbi Soloveitchik, Halachic Man. That was originally written in Hebrew. Somebody translated it into English and it became very famous. Heschel's books about the prophets were written in German. Somebody translated into English, became very famous. Rabbi Uziel was written in Hebrew, he wrote in Hebrew, and he lacks a translator. Rabbi Angel did an amazing job telling his story and translating a few texts. I said, why don't we reprint to this book and add translations of about 20 original articles by Rabbi Uziel. I'm very, very proud to announce that that is gonna be published hopefully this year. You can look at these papers that I'm holding as an example, they're in English. They are English translations that I'm working on of Rabbi Uziel's book. So soon, hopefully not, I will be writing about the book, but you'll be writing about the book, David. Or and somebody. Pabby will be writing about Pabby the book. will be writing about the book and reviewing this reprinted book with brand new translations, bringing right. this Torah, this sunshine Torah that you talk about, about of Rabbi Uziel to the whole Jewish world and non-Jewish world. I love world. that. Everyone needs to see I love that. How incredible thinker he was and why I felt his photo to me defines the Sephardic exhibit on this beautiful exhibit that we have on the museum. I, I am absolutely delighted that that book has come up in this conversation. Yeah. Now I'm gonna channel my inner Ashkenazi and realize that it's 6.03 and we promised you six o'clock. <laughs> so if there's a little leeway, if there are questions from the audience, Mary, you could let me know. If not, we can do some wrap up uh, remarks. Tabby can give us uh, more of a sneak preview on her column next week. And Danielle already gave us a go. Okay, all right. I have a question coming up. How can we ensure, and I'm just seeing, okay, I'm getting, I just got the first half. How can we ensure? I have a feeling I know where the question is going. How can we ensure the continuation of the Sephardic and Mizrahi tradition and preserve this tradition while, while also continuing what I love about this mutual engagement. Because I don't, I, if, if preserving my Sephardic tradition means I stop connecting with the rest of the community, that's too high of a price for me to pay. So I think the real challenge is how do you preserve while engaging? You know, so Tabby, do you want to talk about that? I mean, because you're really right in that 
space. Uh, okay. You know, you. let me, you know, I, I, I thought about this for a few days. And um, before I say that we need, you know, more events and more programs, more inclusion, more Mizrahi on the board of every organization, we, we already know that. We need two things. We need the community to learn about itself and to be able to tell its story. I have a particular wound in my heart when I meet young Persian Jews who don't know their family stories, who can't talk about the Persian Jewish experience, and who frankly don't think it's even relevant to them. And for me, it, it's sort of this uh, metaphor of a window and a, you know, um, a mirror, because every community can be um, a window. Jewish window. You know what do you see? On the other hand, we also need the mirror. We need to be able to see ourselves reflected back into things. Um, to me, it boils down to one thing, David: the schools. Let me explain that really quickly. Chances are, if you're a parent in LA with kids, especially in, in private Jewish schools, or in my case, and in, in, I went to public schools my whole life in the Beverly Hills Unified School System, chances are there are some Persian Jewish kids in the class. And depending on the school district, over 50% of them may be Persian Jews. There is a lack, it doesn't even exist, of speakers coming in, people like me, people like other young leaders, the students themselves, someone takes the time to educate them, to just come and say, hey, you know, at Beverly Hills High School, there are thousands of Persian Jews. Does anybody want to take 30 minutes to, now I know 30 minutes is a lot for a teenager, especially on a lunch break. Does anybody want to take 20 minutes to just come and hear about who we are, what we do, the fact that we're so much more than beating each other with scallions on Passover, though believe me, I would never give that up in a million years, right? It has to start into the schools. What role did Persians or Mizrahis have in the founding of Israel, right? What was going through their minds and their hearts when they made Aliyah, some of them in the 50s? What was going through their minds and in their hearts and in their nightmares and in their fears when the revolution happened? Um, for the past few years, I've taught classes to mostly Persian high school students in a Sunday school class at a local shul. I want to tell you, not only could they not identify Iran on a map, this is where their parents were born, they didn't know the names of people like Theodore Herzl, Ayatollah Khomeini, Jimmy Carter, Yitzhak Rabin, David Ben-Gurion, right? So this is what I say is um, invest in the resources, bring in the speakers, don't make it boring, make it one hell of a you know, speaking gig and bring their history alive for them. Even if you have to serve Persian and Mizrahi food, which we all know gets them in through the door. Love it, I love it. Uh, Danielle, we have one minute. Can yeah. you do a wrap up for one minute? Sure, I mean, you know, I, I'll just start on a personal note by saying um, I feel very blessed to consider myself uh, fairly well educated in the Sephardic tradition, both the intellectual literary tradition as well as the customs. Just for the record, I never attended a Sephardic school a day in my life, not from nursery through my rabbinical university. I never ever attended a Sephardic school. The best Sephardic school that I attended was located on 557 North Orlando Avenue, Apartment 8. It was called the apartment where I grew up, my mother and father. Those were my teachers of Sephardic Judaism. They transmitted that to me. I spoke French and Arabic at home, not English. Our entire way of observing Judaism was deeply rooted at home. Unfortunately, that chain of tradition has been broken by many in our own community. And that's why, for example, like exactly what Tabby said about going to the schools, um, the organization that I very, very proudly have led for the past 10 years, the Sephardic Educational Center, we've made it our mission to not only preserve the tradition of the past, but to actually teach that tradition. We sponsor, together with Rabbi Angel, we have a project called the Sephardic Initiative, where we sponsor uh, 
educators conferences for Jewish day school educators to learn about Sephardic Judaism so that they could incorporate that into their curriculums. We make sure that we have Sephardic rabbis that come every summer for the last five years. I've had Sephardic rabbis from all over the world gather at the Sephardic Educational Center at our beautiful campus in the old city of Jerusalem for a 10-day seminar to study all about Sephardic traditions and then to spread it to their community. This year, we can't go to Jerusalem, so Jerusalem's coming to us. We're having that seminar for the sixth summer, starting next week, like this, on Zoom. We're going to continue to do it, and we're going to continue to spread that message to our communities, to Ashkenazi Jews, to Sephardic Jews. It's all about the E, in my opinion, in the middle of Sephardic Educational Center. The E, education. How do we teach and transmit this, bring this to newspaper articles, books, classes, public schools, so that in the end, no matter if you're a Sephardic or Ashkenazi Jew, you have resources that are able to educate you and teach you about what this means and how it can apply and enhance the experience and upgrade the experience of being Jewish for Ashkenazim and Sephardim. Thank you, thank you, Daniel. I wanna close on one note, which is this book that I read many years ago by Bruce Feiler, and it was this nugget that I've never forgotten. He said, the happiest families are the families that teach their family stories. So that at the Shabbat table, when families get together, if you teach your kids about their grandparents and great grandparents and tell them how they lived and all the family stories, all of a sudden you are creating a frame and in that frame, you're able to handle the good and the bad. So I think in the Jewish community, what we did today with this event is we told stories. And if we want to preserve the Sephardic heritage and the Mizrahi heritage, I think, you know, the component of education and school that I love the most is the word stories. If we created this storytelling mechanism where all the new generation, we can light it up. And I want to tell my Rosewater Coke story. Yeah, it's a fantastic story, but connected to the uh, Bubbies and the Zadies. It's very important. Uh, what's, so, a, what's, a, what's a Bubby and a Zadie? You know a Bubby, Bubby and a Zadie. It's the Ashkenazi version of Papa, Pepe, and Mimi in French. So, you know, and hopefully we're going to put more of these stories in the Jewish Journal. And we often underestimate... Um, we underestimate the power of stories because we assume that the new, the new generation, they're only interested in Twitter and Instagram and the Kardashians and all the latest shows on Netflix. We underestimate the power of stories, stories from our past. I got to tell you, I got so many stories. You can't imagine how many stories I have about my, my grandparents and my great grandparents in Morocco. If we could make those stories really compelling, I think that's how you preserve it. And you know what's absolutely fascinating? The more I learn about the specific Moroccan stories of my ancestors, not only do I connect more to my Sephardic heritage, but I connect to my Jewish heritage because part of those stories was about their connection to Judaism. So I want to thank uh, Council Member David Rue, the Jewish Federation, uh, Rachel and Mary and Donna and Adina Bleich who brought me into this and I said yes without even asking what it was <laughs> and I refer everyone to please go to the exhibit and I can't thank you enough for creating this great event during these very dark days. Thank you David. Um, just so you've seen it in the chat the exhibit is www.jahm-la.com and um, we encourage you all to take a look and have a great evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. you, everyone. Thank you, Tabby. Thank you, Danielle. Pleasure. Thank take you, care. everyone. Good health Be to well. everyone. Be Thank well. Thank you.